Hello, everyone, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Wayne Fowler from We Are the Overcomers. Uh, and I am wanting to get a, a message in as it relates to uh, our, oh my goodness, we've got a call coming in. I do apologize for that. Um, uh, I want to be able to cover what is on our near horizon right now, and that is the rapture of the Bride of Christ. I've noticed that a bunch of people have been actually, including myself, as, as I've uh, posted in my community page, about, uh, about a number of watchmen and watchwomen that have been putting together messages that have gone back to the basics and covering the three harvest model. And, and, and it's in an effort to be able to prepare those that are left behind uh, with the information that they are going to need. Um, as soon as that happens, they're gonna to try to uh, look for what occurred, uh, what's going to happen next, that sort of thing. So that's what we're doing. So one of the things I want to do here in this particular message is I want to cover a couple of things, and that is our Gentile raptured type, and that is uh, Enoch. Uh, and we're going to cover that. We're going to cover a bunch of issues from the month of Sivan, and we are going to look at how close we are based on that. Everybody come in, come in, please. I don't want you to miss this. This is actually going to be, it's going to be a deep study, but I think you're going to be excited about it because of the convergence of calendars and events and things like that, that all of the uh, watchmen and watchwomen are with pieces of the puzzle and they've all come together. And this is so close, so close, so close. Um, I mean, if we're so close, I may not even be able to finish this message. You hear me, Lord? <laughs> so that's what we want to be able to do. Let's start with a prayer and let's get into this, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, our Abba, we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Lord, where we are not able to do that, we're asking that you would be able to give us that desire of our heart. We want to love you with the same love that you love us. Jesus, we want to be connected in, 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 in perfect union with you, and we know that you are at the door. Help this word to go out and Touch the hearts of those that need to hear it, that are looking to hear it, that are desiring to hear it. You know who they are. And we just uh, want to praise you and thank you for who you are and look so forward to your appearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's, I want to start, in, in, because I've got a number of things to look at, what I want to do here is I want to start with something uh, that is discussing about the month of Sivan. Now, where this is all going to tie together as it relates to Enoch, well, Enoch was, as a little tickler here, was a Gentile, that was before the Jewish nation was formed, and he was raptured and taken to heaven without seeing death. And uh, despite what, uh, there are some naysayers out there that say, no, 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 that's not what happened. But I'm gonna cover this in a lot of ways. You're gonna see that. I, I mean, you, you would really have to be hard pressed to go like, yeah, that's kind of what it says. Yeah, it's very close to, to, to what it says. So we're gonna cover that. And, uh, and he was born and taken to heaven on the same day, which is the 6th of Sivan, okay? And we are coming up 
on that day here very shortly. I'm going to show you that. Now, let's, and this particular piece that I have here is a little excerpt uh, from a Messianic Jewish community. And I, I was struck by this because the very first uh, verse that's listed in here at the top of this in discussing this is watch and pray because you're going to see the theme that we're going to get through here uh, covering up to Shavuot, all right? And that's the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks, which is the actual countdown of the barley harvest to the end where we have the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest, okay? All right, so watch and pray, therefore, and uh, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming to pass on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. That is Luke 21, 36. And it's something that we're all doing, and I hope that you're doing as well, uh, especially now. And I thought that that was so pertinent in this, uh, that that verse came up. So here, let's talk about the month of Sivan. It says the month of Sivan is the third month in the biblical calendar, counting from Nisan. In Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2, this month was referred to as Quote, the third month. However, its name was changed sometime after Israel's Babylonian captivity. The word Sivan roughly means season. Ooh, that would perk up your ears, wouldn't it? That we will know the times and seasons, right? And it roughly means season or time and usually coincides with May to June on the Gregorian calendar, okay? Shavuot commemorates the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai and is celebrated on the 6th of Sivan. God's land down other. How you doing, brother? It's good to see you. Uh, the word Shavuot means weeks because it marks the Israelites' seven-week journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Another meaning for Shavuot is oaths which refers to the covenant, that's O-A-T-H-S, oaths, the covenant God made with the Israelite nation, a binding covenant like a wedding covenant. What do you think about that? God's covenant with Israel in the month of Sivan. The Israelites entered the desert of Sinai on the first day of the month of Sivan. Then they set up camp at the base of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2. A few days later, and we'll go into this in deeper detail going forward, God commanded Moses to prepare the people for his appearance in verses 10 and 11. Following the Israelites' preparation period, God descended upon Mount Sinai on the sixth day of Sivan. 50 days after the Exodus, according to Jewish tradition. Now, we're going to be uh, covering how uh, some folks call it uh, Pentecost, and uh, uh, but I, 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 I would rather look, and I want you to just follow with me, and let's call it the Feast of Weeks. Let's call it Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks harvest, because that's what's about to happen, brothers and sisters, is a harvest, and it's a barley harvest. That's what's happening here, okay? Um, on Mount Sinai, God spoke directly to the Israelite nation and gave them the Torah, which included the Ten Commandments to guide them in Exodus 20. God also made a covenant with the Israelites and promised to bless them if they followed his laws. They agreed to the terms of God's covenant and promised to obey his commandments. As a result, they became God's kingdoms of priests 
and holy nation in Exodus 19, verse 6. And we're going to find out a little bit later that actually that was the marriage proposal and the people then said, I do. We're going to cover that a little bit later. The month of Sivan and the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, okay? Shavuot also commemorated the end of the spring harvest. In the Bible, the name Shavuot is also referred to as the Feast of Harvest in Exodus 23, verse 16, and the Feast of Weeks in Exodus 34, verses 22 through 23. Moreover, it was one of the three pilgrim festivals mentioned in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. During ancient Bible times, Jewish men were expected to travel to Jerusalem and bring the first harvest, the first fruits of their crops to the temple. It was a joyous festival and an offering of thanksgiving to God for his provision. However, after, and this is really important, so I want you to consider this, that after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Jews could no longer bring the first fruits of their harvest as offerings. So the rabbis decided that the focus of Shavuot would be God's giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, okay? So in other words, that only happened after the destruction of the temple. We also know that there's going to be another temple. So this is going to be reinstituted again. They are going to be looking and counting the Omer. They are going to be uh, putting back in all of the harvest or agricultural themes as we're going to go through here. The month of Sivan and the Feast of Pentecost. Now, while the Jewish community celebrates Shavuot, the Christian community celebrate Pentecost. The word Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50. This special day is celebrated 50 days after Easter Sunday. Now, I don't agree with that particular part. We're not going to uh, discuss that particular thing, but we're going to say that it's 50 days after uh, after uh, a Passover, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about here. So I'm not going to call it, remember, this was not my writing. Pentecost commemorates the giving and receiving of the Holy Spirit. Also, it memorializes the birth of the church in the New Testament under Acts 2. Jesus directed his disciples to remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came in Acts 1, verses 3 and 4. At the same time, Jews from various countries were arriving to celebrate the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. It is interesting to note that in the New Testament, the Greek-speaking Jews referred to the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest as the Feast of Pentecost. Acts 2 tells the account of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the 120 disciples and other Jewish believers in Acts 2, verses 1 to 31. The Holy Spirit convicted the crowd through the disciples' teachings and a harvest of souls, amen, some 3,000 were gathered and added to the church that day in Acts 2, verse 41. The month of Sivan represents the provision of God both naturally and spiritually. The spiritual provision of this month include both the giving of the Torah and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, both God's instructions and the Holy Spirit are needed to worship God the way he desires us to worship him. God's instructions give us guidelines for living and the Holy Spirit empowers us to stay within those boundaries. Amen? All right. So that's one of the things that we're going to talk about here. I want to keep that focus on the feast of harvest. This is a harvest season. It's the spring harvest. It is the barley harvest, folks, that leads down. It's a countdown. It's not a count up. It's a countdown, right? And it's a purpose for it. And we're going to cover that in uh, greater detail. 
the day that nothing happened. Now, this is a little excerpt uh, from uh, La, uh, Luba Victor Rebe, okay, courtesy of MeaningfulLife.com. Now, it's, it's a little excerpt that I want to use to talk about what happened on the first six days of Sivan. And that's going to kind of prepare you. Ah, keyword, you're going to hear that word preparation because that's what it's all about, brothers and sisters. Ah, hello from Switzerland. Oh, my goodness. It's good to see you here. <laughs> Excellent. And everyone else, I, I want you to know that I'm so glad to see you here right now. I know it's it's early in the morning in a, in a lot of places, uh, but here down under, uh, it's it's just early evening. All right. Um, the day that nothing happened. Now, on the first of Sivan, Moses did not say anything at all to the Jewish people since they were weary from the journey. That's from the Talmud, Shabbat 86b. On the first day of the month of Sivan, in the year 2448 from creation, 1313 BCE, six weeks after the Exodus, the people of Israel arrived at Mount Sinai. Six days later, the entire nation stood at the foot of the mountain as God revealed himself to them and gave them the Torah. Ever since, we celebrate the festival of Shavuot, Sivan 6 through 7, as the time of the giving of our Torah. The 19th chapter of the book of Exodus describes the final week of preparation for the revelation at Sinai. Analyzing the Torah's account, the Talmud, Shabbat 86b through 88a, pieces together the following chronicle of events for these six days. First of Sivan. Moses did not say anything at all to the Jewish people since they were weary from the journey. Second of Sivan, at dawn, Moses ascends Mount Sinai. He brings back the following message from God. You have seen what I have done to Egypt and how I bore you upon the wings of eagles and brought you to myself. Amen. Now, if you will obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my chosen treasure from among all the nations, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 19, verse 4 through 6. With these words, God expressed his desire that we become his chosen people. The day is accordingly marked in our calendar as Yom Ha Mayukas the day of designation. On the third of Sivan, God commands Moses to fence in Mount Sinai, marking the boundaries where everyone is to stand when God reveals himself upon the mountain and gives them the Torah. The Kohanim, or the priests, may approach closer than the rest of the people. Aaron may approach closer than the Kohanim, while Moses alone will be summoned by God to ascend. Now, I want to stop here, and I want to reiterate what you're seeing here. Uh, uh, and I see some more people, please, coming in as, as you come in. I see you all. I'm so glad to see you. This particular thing is revealing three different groups that, I, that is kind of a basis of what I talk about in the three harvest model. Let's read that again. God reveals himself on the mountain and gives them the Torah. The Kohanim, which is the priests, they may approach closer than the rest of the people. Aaron may approach closer than the Kohanim, while Moses alone will be summoned by God to ascend. Okay? Very important. So you've got the general people, you've got the priest, Aaron, and you know, with the Aaron, and then you've got uh, Moses, who is alone ascending up to God. Now, on the fourth of Sivan, the Jewish people are instructed to purify and sanctify themselves 
in preparation. Now, remember I said that preparation, we're going to see this a lot here, for the giving of the Torah by suspending marital relations and immersing in a mikvah. The fifth of Sivan, Moses builds an altar at the foot of the mountain and seals the covenant between God and Israel. The entire people proclaim, all that God commands, we shall do and we shall hear. Now, that's them saying, I do. He gave the offer and they accepted it. They accepted the, the marriage proposal. Sixth of Sivan, the giving of the Torah. When morning came, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mountain. The voice of the shofar sounded growing stronger and stronger. God descended upon Mount Sinai and spoke the following words saying, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Now, I'm, I'm sorry if, if you should, if, if that doesn't just, oh, I, what it does to me, that's a rapture if there ever was a rapture. And when do we see that? On the 6th of Sivan. Interesting. I want you to hold on to that, okay? All right. Now, let me look at, this is just a, a quick thing to kind of give you a synopsis of uh, what uh, Shavuot is or the Feast of Weeks. As I mentioned before, it's a Jewish holiday celebrated between, and that's going to be for this year, on June 11 through the 13th on the Gregorian calendar. Let me read that again. The Jewish holiday celebrated in 2024 on June 11th through the 13th on the Gregorian calendar. That is what the Jews are saying, okay? Now, that's a very important point, okay? Uh, the holiday has both an agricultural and biblical significance. Agriculturally, it marks the wheat harvest in Israel. Now, See, that's quite, that's a little bit misleading though, right? What that marks is the start of the wheat harvest and the end of the barley harvest. That's actually the first fruits of the wheat on the last omer, the last part of the harvest of the barley Okay, now that's that's going to be bearing on us because I think that the barley is representative of the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride of Christ. Okay, agriculturally, it marks the wheat in Israel. Biblically, it commemorates the day God gave the nation, uh, nation of Israel the Torah on Mount Sinai. The holiday, now this is what I thought was interesting. The holiday also bookends the counting of the Omer, a ritualized counting of each of the 49 days between Passover and Shavuot. The tradition represents the anticipation around God's gift of the Torah. Now, if, if many of you, if, if you've been following me for a while, you have seen that I have had numerous uh, dreams and visions and uh, words from the Lord that talk about bookends. And you'll find that, that I have covered that in a number of messages. But I found this awfully interesting, like what a confirmation that was to find this, and especially right now as I'm covering it, and it talks about the holiday being the bookends for the counting of the Omer, and uh, the, the bookends being Passover to Shavuot, okay? Interesting, interesting, folks. How about a little bit of history? The word Shavuot means weeks. Holiday celebrates the completion, this is what I'm saying, the completion of the seven-week Omer duration between Passover and Shavuot. 
God had gifted the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai more than 3,300 years ago. The occasion of Shavuot allows believers to renew their acceptance of this gift, and God blesses them once again with the Torah. The Feast of Weeks commemorates this revelation of the Torah on Mount Sinai and begins on the 50th day after the 49 days of counting the Omer. Shavuot is one of the Shalot Regalim, or the three pilgrimage festivals in Judaism. The observance is associated with the grain harvest mentioned in the Torah. It took Moses and his companions and followers from Israel seven weeks of trekking to reach Mount Sinai. The conclusion of this seven-week-long journey is Shavuot. The timing of the holiday gives reason to believe that Shavuot may already have been an ancient agricultural festival that coincided with the events that happened on Mount Sinai. Due to this agricultural aspect, Jews often bring the outdoors indoors by adorning their houses with flowers and greenery. The holiday is also celebrated by many Jews staying up all night to study and prepare for the revelation of the Torah on Erev Shavuot. This is known as the Shavuot Night Watch. All right, do you see it? Do you see it, brothers and sisters? All right, as far as this night watch goes, let's look at a few things that are coming up. We have seen so many signs and and uh, that that are happening in the in the skies and so many signs that are happening on the earth and that's just what the prophet joel is tells us is going to happen i i, I find something that's very interesting that's happening around this time period all right and that is a uh, planetary alignment that is going to be taken. Now, one of the things that we have to consider it, are that signs are just that. What do you look at? You, a sign is a representation of telling you something that's ahead, right? Something that's after the sign. You know, what good would it be to get a sign on the side of the road when you've already passed the thing that it's coming to. It doesn't happen that way. You have signs that tell you, hey, coming up behind you there, uh, coming up in front of you, which would be behind me, uh, you know, how we're doing that. Uh, that's what's going to come ahead. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Mickey D's is going to be up ahead in, in however uh, many miles or kilometers, whatever. But we've got the same thing for the signs in the skies, okay? Uh, here we have an alignment of the planets, and I want to show you something here. This is pretty, I think, uh, pretty amazing. So I'm going to show you this. And now I had a person who had mentioned in the comments on my last message that I didn't hold the, the things up there long enough for them to read them. Well, I'm, I'm wanting you, I'm expecting you to be able to either pause the message and and uh, and then read it that way or take a snapshot of it and you can follow along with it as I continue to look at it, okay? So I'm only going to leave it up there for a few seconds, uh, but I'm not going to hold it up there the whole time so that you can read it, okay? All right, so with that in mind, let's take a look at this one. All right, so if you can take a snapshot of that, all right? All right, and I thought this is really, really interesting. This is a planetary alignment that's going to be happening as shown here on June the 3rd, okay? 10 days before Shavuot, 10 days, interesting. I, 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 I see these certain things again, and, and you know, where people are coming up with 
10 days or seven days or, or these various different things. There's a lot of folks that believe that uh, Jesus, uh, he, he was uh, taken up into the clouds uh, on the 40th day and then 10 days after then would be Shavuot or Pentecost, right? That, that's very interesting, especially if uh, Shavuot is on the 11th through the 13th in this year, okay? Now, take a look at this and, and, and what you can see. I want to draw your attention to Mars. That is the god of war. Now, of course, we're not looking at this from a standpoint of, of astrology or anything like that. We're just looking at these as signs, and we can see that right there, dead center, splitting the uh, constellation of Pisces is Mars, and that's very interesting. So we have the two fish, right? We've got rapture fish, and then we have left behind fish, okay? And they're right in the middle of that, that's separating them, so it, it it's like prepare for the, you know, there's a lot of folks saying that, okay, immediately after we depart, then that's when, you know, uh, that's when everything just falls apart, right? Uh, you'll notice that right underneath is the constellation of Cetus or the sea monster or dragon, okay? And, uh, and so that's interesting that this is going to happen right there. It splits it there. And it's, uh, we, we won't go into all of the other things. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and look at that, but keep that in mind. Take a look at it uh, and, uh, and just note once again, so that's a signpost, okay, that happens on June the 3rd. <clears throat> I want to give you another, I, I took a little snippet here from <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Let me take a quick sip of water here. Uh, thank you, Baba. Okay. This is a little snapshot of a section of Brother Repo Man 64, Brother Mike's uh, timeline. And uh, this is the re uh, relevant, sorry about the us, this is relevant to what we're actually discussing today. And I want to show you that. So be prepared to take a little snapshot of this one. Okay. All right. Now, I want to draw your attention to the left-hand side of your screen. And you're going to notice here that we're looking at uh, where Jesus ascends, Shavuot, and which is uh, Sivan 15th. Now, I'm not going to be covering a lot of different things here, but there's, there's a bunch of information that you're going to see that they're all culminating together, okay? Now, uh, the 15th day of the third month, I've done other messages on that. You can go back and take a look at them. I'm not going to cover them in detail. What I just want to be able to focus on here is the interesting convergence that this is typically Shavuot, but the Jews are going to be celebrating Shavuot that's, that they actually list on the Hebrew calendar as the 11th through the 13th of June, okay? Which they are claiming then is Sivan 6 and 7. Now, this is very interesting because what Brother Mike has here is he, he has Shavuot up there at the top, and then you can see the number of sevens because there are seven-day warnings and, and things that we're going to see here. Moses ascends to Mount Sinai. He waits seven days. Noah also waited seven days in the door of the ark uh, before the flood came. And uh, then, of course, we, we have uh, Enoch, who is born and raptured on the 6th of Sivan. Now, it's interesting uh, 
Uh, so you've got Ascension Day here, 365 years old. That's when he's going up. But again, you see how this is converging Sivan 6 and 7 to Sivan 15 from this particular group, but they're all seeing it the same as happening in, you know, the uh, week of June. So that, that that's, that's very interesting. Uh, now, uh, Brother Mike has it here for, uh, uh, as being Sivan 15 on May 30th, but I, I don't think that that is is really the point. The point is how everything is just rock solid together on this point, okay? And so just to drive this point home, this is what we have here. All right, let me take a little snapshot of that. All right, and the reason why this is so important is because they are saying Shavuot is on the evening of Tuesday, 11th of June, 2024, through 13th of June, 2024. Now, this is very interesting, too. So hold on to this. Since so many people want to point to Feast of Trumpets, why? It's a two-day uh, day. It's the long day and that sort of thing. As if there's no other two-day recognized point. Well, that's what we've got here. Shavuot is a two-day Jewish holiday that falls on the Hebrew calendar dates of Sivan 6 and 7. Here are the coinciding secular dates for the upcoming years, Shavuot 2024, which begins on sundown on Tuesday. June the 11th, 2024, and concludes at nightfall on Thursday, June 13th, 2024. Now, that would be what I would say could be the last day. Think about it. Think about it. If that's, that's going to be the last day of the barley harvest. This is going to be the last day of the celebration of Shavuot or the recognition of Shavuot. And it's very interesting also that it happens on a Thursday when we have so many people who have had rapture dreams and, and visions of this thing uh, uh, with the rapture occurring on a Thursday. That's just an aside. Very interesting though, as I see it. Okay. Let's continue on because I got so much here that I want to uh, I want to get into Enoch now, okay? Uh, and so what I'm going to start with is because Enoch was born and raptured on the 6th of Sivan, and uh, this is coinciding with Shavuot or Pentecost. You see how these things are coming together, right? I want to point out some really cool things, all right? So let's start with, I'm going to go ahead and set a, a foundation scripture out of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. And I've done this a number of times, but we're going to do it again. Brother Wade, it's good to see you. Uh, it says, by faith. Now, please pay attention to this because every word in God's word is important, okay? By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, this is a couple of verses that I try to use to point out that, that being included in a pre-trib rapture, which is a reward. How do we know it's a, it says it's a reward right here, folks? And, and it was, oh, no, no, that's just... 
accidental, coincidental, by chance. Really? God's word is coincidental? There's a, there's a chance? No, 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 no. There's no chance. There's no randomness. There's no capriciousness in God's word. Every single word is there for a purpose, and it is deep. There's plenty to be gleaned from that. So how was Enoch taken up that he should not see death? By faith. And, okay, so what does that mean? We can look at this and we can say, if he did not have faith that he would be taken up so that he would not see death, would he have been taken up? Well, I think not, because God is only pleased uh, if you have faith. And it says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Hmm. Okay. So if you're not pleasing God, I, I just have a hard time just uh, trying to go along with some of those people that say, no, 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 no. Everybody goes in a pre-trib rapture of the church. Why? Well, because, you know, because we think that's the way it should be. And it doesn't matter what they're reading here. It doesn't apply to them or something like that. Okay. But let's just read God's word and let's, let's see what it says. I mean, let's just with open minds, with open ears, with open eyes, with open hearts, and just read and let the Holy Spirit show you what this says. By faith, okay, that's the, that's the mechanism that Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Well, God took him, and we should assume that he was taken up. He had the faith that he should not see death. Now, there are other folks that say, nope, nope, nope. He actually died because further down there it says, these having not received the promises all died in the faith. Oh, my goodness. You've really got to butcher God's word to be able to come up with stuff like that. Yeah, you can cut and paste like it was a, a ransom note or something. No, it, it talks uh, plainly that Abraham and uh, was looking forward to seeing the promise and it says that he died in faith, having not received the promise. Okay? I mean, it's not talking about Enoch. It's, <laughs> wow. All right. So it was talking about Abraham and Sarai and uh, the several others that were there in the paragraph before he says that. Here, we're talking about Enoch. He did not see death. He was taken by God, and he had the faith to do it. Right? Okay, I want to go ahead and, and here we're going to get into some that I was waiting for this. Okay, so this is the big part of this whole whole message, at least I think so. Now I'm going to read you a segment out of the book of Jasher. Okay, now this is not, and, and it's important to understand that the pre-trib rapture is a reward. It's not a salvation issue because salvation is a free gift. Gifts are not rewards. Rewards are earned. Gifts are given freely, and that's what Jesus did on the cross. He died, and uh, he gave us his uh, saving grace, his, his blood, and that's what we are cleansed by. Oh my goodness, thank you, Jesus, for your cleansing blood. And look, when he offered that free gift to us. And when you receive that free gift by faith, it's by faith. That's what we were talking about. You receive it by faith, then you are saved. Okay. All right. So what I'm reading here out of the book of Jasher is not uh, uh, dealing with salvation, but it gives us a lot of really good information as it relates to Enoch and his rapture, okay? So I'm going to read just from verses out of chapter 3, out of the book of Jasher, verses 22 through 37. Now, I want to show you this because I've marked this up 
And there's, I, I want you to uh, uh, just to be able to see some things that I'm highlighting here, okay? And, and we're going to cover these in depth. Okay, let's see if I can get you there, okay? I hope you can see that. All right. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start reading it. I am going to interject in each of these because there's so much that I have here, which I think is just all of this stuff is coming out here now. 20, uh, verse 22, chapter 3, book of Jasher. And the day came when Enoch went forth, and they all assembled and came to him. And Enoch spoke to them the words of the Lord, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge. And they bowed down before him, and they said, May the king live, may the king live. Verse 23. And in some time after, when kings and princes and the sons of men, three groups, folks, were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God. Behold, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven and wished to bring him up to heaven to make him reign over the sons of God. Now, we're going to stop right here for a minute. This is an encapsulation, as I see it, from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, right? And this is where we get the process. Uh, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ah, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen, amen, right? Okay, so what do we have here? We have the Lord, an angel that's calling out, all right, from Enoch. The Lord is wanting to bring him up to heaven where he's going to rule over who? The sons of God. Now, the sons of God We see that that that's listed in the book of Job several times. We know those are the angels, okay? The angels in heaven were called the sons of God. So we've got three groups, but the sons of, and it's interesting, and Enoch, kings and princes and the sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God, okay? Okay. And uh, so it's interesting that kings and princes are comprising a single group. And we'll see this here a little bit later. Sons of men. So even though it says kings and princes, the princes are not, I don't see them as separate. Kings and princes, kings and princes, Uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, Pharisees and Sadducees, okay? Sons of men. And then they are going to call up Enoch where he is going to reign with there in heaven over the angels. Remember, we are told that we will judge angels, okay? All right, let's move on to verse 24. When at that time, oh, wait a minute, let me go ahead and finish that. Reign over the sons of God as he had reigned over the sons of men upon earth. Remember that in... So he is a king, and he has reigned over the sons of men upon earth. Now he's going to reign over the sons of God. Verse 24, when at that time Enoch heard this and went and assembled all of the inhabitants of the earth. That's that's all of them, okay? That's one big group. And taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instructions. And he said to them, I have been required to ascend into heaven. I therefore do not know the day of my going. Now, I'm going to stop here because, again, I'm going to pop that. It's interesting that we have uh, so many that want to parrot the no man knows the day or the hour. 
and and that's very interesting. Uh, in the book of Mark, we have an ascension of Jesus as an example, and I see Enoch is also acting as a type of Jesus. We can see that here as well as the uh, the type of the Gentile bride that's going to be raptured as well because he's associated with Jesus. And in Mark, he ascends. In Matthew, it's not mentioned. And in Luke, Jesus is carried up, okay, or taken up. All right, so we'll cover that. So I find it very interesting. So I therefore do not know the day of my going. But you're going to find out that later on, he does know, okay? He didn't know right then, but he does know later on. Verse 25. And now, therefore, I will teach you wisdom and knowledge, and I will give you instruction before I leave you how to act upon earth whereby you may live. And he did so. Verse 26, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them instruction, and he reproved them, and he placed before them statutes and judgments to do upon earth and he made peace amongst them, and he taught them everlasting life, and dwelt with them sometime, teaching them all these things. Verse 27, and at that time, the sons of men, now we're going to see this a lot, the sons of men, I want to focus, it's, it's actually quite a focus on these as we're going to see as we move through there. And at that time, the sons of men were with Enoch, and Enoch was speaking to them, and they lifted up their eyes, and the likeness of a great horse descended from heaven, and the horse paced in the air. And they told Enoch what they had seen. And Enoch said to them, on my account does this horse descend upon earth. The time is come when I must go from you, and I shall no more be seen by you. Verse 29, and the horse descended at that time and stood before Enoch, and all the sons of men that were with Enoch saw him. Please hold on to that again. The sons of men, the sons of men, the sons of men, the sons of men, okay? Verse 30, and Enoch then again ordered a voice to be proclaimed saying, where is the man who delighteth to know the ways of the Lord his God? Let him come this day to Enoch before he is taken from us. Now, see, you, you, this is very interesting because, and we see so many parallels from this, and we're going to see the parallels from Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. We're going to get to that here in a minute, and then we'll cover the Omer uh, because that's, that's the countdown. We are in the countdown, folks. All right. Verse 29, uh, verse 30, and then verse 31. All right. Verse 31, and all the sons of men, there we are again, assembled and came to Enoch that day. And all the kings of the earth with their princes and counselors remained with him that day. Now there's going to be another thing. I want you to keep your uh, ear open to the word remain because we're going to see the, a theme here also taking place. And Enoch then taught, excuse me, the sons of men, wisdom and knowledge, and gave them divine instruction. And he bade them serve the Lord and walk in his ways all the days of their lives. And he continued to make peace amongst them. He was a peacemaker. Now this, this really gets, oh, this is so cool. Verse 32, and it was after this, that he rose up and rode upon the horse. Rose up, interesting. And he went forth and all the sons of men, here we are again, went after him. 
about 800,000 men. Okay, and that's interesting. So where do we have another parallel, right? What, where do we, that the number eight is very interesting here. Don't we have eight people on the ark as well? But here we have 800,000 men. There's several zeros that we're dealing with here. There's a lot of people that this is uh, referencing that is going to, to, to be relevant here. And they went with him one day's journey. Verse 33. And on the second day, he said to them, return home to your tents. Why will you go? Perhaps you may die. And some of them went from him. And those that remained went with him six days journey. And Enoch said to them every day, return to your tents, lest you may die. But they were not willing to return and they went with him. Now, this is interesting because we see the same thing in 2 Kings. Again, I want to just go ahead and point this out. Uh, if you want to look at 2 Kings chapter 2, I'm just going to uh, cover this. It's, and uh, it says, now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. And Elisha says, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they go on to Bethel, right? Uh, verse four, and Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Sounding familiar, folks? Then in verse six, and Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he says for a third time, the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not live, uh, leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, what I find interesting here, since I happen to be on the second Kings chapter two, there's an interesting thing that says, verse nine, when they had crossed, Elijah says to Elisha, ask what I shall do to you before I am taken from you. Now, this is something very interesting because Elisha is left behind. He is representative of the left behind church. This is, I find this very interesting. He says, so what does Elisha say? Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Now, it's interesting. He's first trying to dissuade him all the, you know, from all these different places. Don't, don't go with me. Don't go with me. Nope, I'm going with you right up to the point that he's going to be taken from him, Elijah is going to be taken up. And he says, what shall I do for you before I'm taken up from you? Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Okay. Now, this is one of the things that I thought. I would not be asking for a double portion of your spirit on me. I would be asking, take me with you. Why didn't he say that? Right? Right. He wants the double spirit, a double portion of his spirit, and then he goes back because he sees Elijah taken up and he is left behind, right? Okay, but he gets a double portion. That's, that's what's going to happen. The left behind will have an opportunity for a double portion, but I'm the one that's going to ask, take me with you, and I'm hoping that you too, brothers and sisters, are doing that very thing. If you get a chance to ask, what do you want? I want to go with you. Call me up, Jesus. I want to be with you. Amen? All right, so let's continue on. Um, and um, verse 34. And on the sixth day, some of the men remained. Now, remember I said, let's talk about the remaining this is the remainder, and they clung to him, and they said to him, we will go with thee to the place where thou goeth. As the Lord liveth, death only shall separate us. And they urged so much to go with him 
that he ceased speaking to them and they went after him and would not return. Okay, now this is, but look at this. There were a lot of them that did return. Each time he was, in, and you notice what he, he said, he never said that they would die, right? And, and what, it reminds me of, of Peter uh, talking about John, and he, he says, well, uh, you know, what about him? Is he going to die too, you know? And, and he never said he wouldn't die, but that's what he, that, that's what Peter goes and implies, right? This is interesting because he says in verse 33, why will you go? Perhaps you may die. He never says you will. <clears throat> he says you may die. Well, you may not, right? And perhaps you may. Well, even the chance that you are, isn't it worth risking your life for, giving your life for? He who loses his life for my sake shall have it, right? That's what Jesus tells us. So let's, let's not worry about your life and then turn away. He sees that's what he's going. But there are a group of men that remained, okay? All right, so that's what we want to do. Death only shall separate us. Now, let's continue. 35, uh, 36, excuse me. And when the kings, there we go, that's that other group, returned, they caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men that went with Enoch. And those who are alive and remain, I'm going to keep saying that, folks. And it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind. Whoa, wait a minute, another whirlwind here, right? With horses, plural, and chariots, plural, of fire. And what do we have in Elijah? We have uh, verse 11, chapter 2 of 2 Kings. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots, plural, of fire, and horses, plural, of fire, separated the two of them. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't see this. I mean, how, how much closer can you get in exactly this being the same thing? Now, let's follow this. The kings returned. Yeah, they, they didn't want anything to do with this, right? And, and you notice I said kings and princes, there we, we're talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the ruling group. They were the ruling uh, group of people over uh, Israel. And uh, that's why I think that we've got kings and priests here. They, they don't want to have anything to do with this. They're not going to go with, uh, uh, with Enoch. Only the sons of men, that group, went with Enoch. The kings and princes, they returned, right? And uh, so they returned and caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men, remaining again, that went with Enoch. And it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. Now, verse 37. And on the eighth day, all of the kings that had been with Enoch sent to bring back the number of men that were with Enoch in the place from which he ascended into heaven. Okay. Then finally, in verse 38, and all those kings went to the place, they went after, right? So this is after this, after all of this has taken place, now all of these kings are coming to that place. And they found the earth there filled with snow. And upon the snow were large stones of snow or large hailstones, right? About the weight of a talent, you know, or a a uh, hundred pounds, you know, that I don't know. Uh, and one said to the other, come, let us break through the snow and see perhaps the men that remained with Enoch are dead. 
and are now under the stones of snow. And they searched, but could not find him, for he had ascended into heaven. Now, I'm going to stop something. Did you hear how that happened? They're talking about looking for the men that remained, and they're going to look under the stone of snow, and they searched, but could not find him, for he had ascended. So in other words, you've got men that are associated with Enoch. They're so closely associated that they then say they searched for him and could not find him because he ascended into heaven. Okay. I, and what does that mean to us? That means the bride that is brought into perfect union with Jesus and that that union shows there's never separation. There's it's a, a complete and perfect union. The barley harvest is associated with the first fruits of that barley harvest, which is Jesus. Okay. So every other the part of that the rest of that harvest, the main part of that harvest is still barley. It is so closely associated with Jesus or is so closely associated with the first fruits, there is no difference. The first fruits is Jesus. The main harvest is the barley that goes with Jesus. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Okay. All right. So I appreciate that. I want to end on this and I want to go back and discuss in continuing to deal with the barley harvest. Okay. <clears throat> Now, this is from Beth Emanuel Messianic Synagogue on the counting of the Omer. No small consequence. The counting of the days of the Omer is a biblical commandment incumbent upon every Jew. Traditionally, the period of the Omer count is to be a time of spiritual introspection as the counters prepare themselves, there's a time of preparation, folks, for Shavuot. Because it begins during Passover and concludes at Shavuot, the counting of the Omer remembers the journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. The messianic implications of the Omer and the subsequent countdown are great. It's a countdown, folks, right? We're counting down to that last day. According to Matthew 28, 1, Yeshua rose after the Sabbath as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. Hebraic expression for Havdalah hour that ends the Sabbath on Saturday night. We cannot help but notice that the appointed day for harvesting the barley omer coincides with the resurrection of Mashiach. In a remarkable display of God's sovereign planning, the Torah set aside the resurrection as the day of fruits, 14, uh, first fruits, 1400 years before its occurrence. Just as the first Omer of barley was brought as a first fruits of the whole harvest, so too Messiah's resurrection was a first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. This is the imagery Paul invokes with the words, Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Just as the first fruits of the barley made all of the rest of the harvest kosher for harvest, so too the resurrection of Mashiach makes the resurrection of the dead possible, counting the days of Messiah. Because of the resurrection and the connection to Pentecost, the counting of the Omer is an important mitzvah for believers. Mitzvah is uh, rules. According to Jewish tradition, <clears throat> excuse me, the counting is done in the following prescribed manner. Thank you, Amba. Even after the prayers each day, the counter recites a blessing. 
Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to count the Omer. Then the counter simply states, today is X days of the Omer. The person counting follows his formal declaration of the Omer day with a recitation of Psalm 67 and a few short petitions for a spiritual cleansing and renewal. Tradition prescribes the recitation of Psalm 67 because it is comprised of exactly 49 Hebrew words, which correspond to the 49 days of the Omer count. The Psalm is seasonally appropriate because of the harvest motif. It is spiritually appropriate because it speaks clearly of God's salvation, Yeshua, being made known over all the earth. The counting of the Omer creates a countdown to Shavuot, the time of the giving of the Torah and the time of the giving of the Holy Spirit and the time of the rapture of Enoch. As such, it guides us on a spiritual journey of preparation. It is a journey which is begun with Passover, the symbol of our salvation in Yeshua and completed at Pentecost, the symbol of our completion through the Spirit. The distance of days between the two events should be the time of spiritual reflection, growth, purification and preparation. It's the preparation of the bride, folks, right? And the bride preparation will be ended on the last day of the Omer, which is on Shavuot. The Omer is over, excuse me, the Omer ends on the 49th day, and then the next day, the 50th day, is the Feast of Wheat. It's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So we have the last day of the barley harvest, and then we begin the uh, harvest of the wheat, okay? The master's resurrection makes the counting of the Omer a season of special significance and joy. For his disciples, it is a time to remember the resurrected Yeshua. All of his post-resurrection appearances fell within the days of the Omer count. Now, that's a lot of, it's something that you don't hear a lot, but yeah, that's it. It really does. All of the appearances of Jesus, whether it's to, uh, you know, uh, whether it's to Thomas in the upper room, whether it's to Mary Magdalene, or whether the women in the garden, you know, whatever, to the disciples, all of that happens over and um, over the the 500 uh it's happening over the countdown of the omer uh even the uh, the two disciples on the road to emmaus you, you name it all yeah so there's got to be something there right that's that's got to be important right so i want you to consider that at the end of the first day of the omer he arose and appeared to miriam and to two of our number with the, uh, oh yeah, with they traveled to Emmaus and also to Peter. On the second day of the Omer, he appeared to the, uh, I don't know, that's cut off, among the 12. On the ninth day of the Omer, he appeared to us again and Thomas was with us. During the counting, he appeared, well, and I just said all this, he appeared to 500 of our number and then to James. During the counting, he appeared to seven of our number while they fished on the sea. On the 40th day of the Omer, he left out to a hill near Bethany and we saw him ascend to heaven. Before he ascended, he commanded us not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. We waited and counted the days. 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49 days of the Omer. 
And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, we were all together in one place. And we know then what happens next. I think uh, just as we have in the uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, what do we have? We have Elijah going up and his mantle falling down at the very same time, giving a double portion to those left behind, to Elisha that's left behind. And what I see here is what's going to happen, I hope, is that we will be going up as the Holy Spirit is going to be pouring down a double portion on those left behind. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm telling you, we are that close and I am that ready. Am I saying it's going to happen on that day? No, I'm not. I don't know. But what we can take is everything that we have seen in the scriptures that I've read you a bunch of them, right? We can see the parallels. We can see the types and shadows. We can see the connections here. And I find it very interesting that they all converge, even whether it's the Jews seeing the Sivan 6 and 7, whether it's the uh, Sivan 15, uh, you know, uh, third month, 15th day of the month. They're all coming and they're showing up together. But let's look at these days right now, right now because up to and including, and I would think that the Jews are supposed to be provoked to jealousy and what a wonderful way that would be if it was to happen when the Jews are expecting it. It makes sense to me that that would be the case. If it didn't happen on when the Jews were expecting something else, it wouldn't make a difference to them. They would go like, yeah, so what? It, would, it just... Yeah, so uh, so there's a bunch of Christians missing. Well, okay, good for them. But if it happened on a, a day that the Jews recognize, even if it's the wrong day, do you understand what I'm saying? It's the day they think. Then they are going to be wondering, wait a minute. I think you that that's going to be, I really think that that's going to be the, the case. And it's going to stick with them because they're going to be left behind. All right, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and leave you with this. Uh, it's we we are so close. We are so very close. I am just I'm, I'm just really beside myself. I hope that this is helpful to you, and I hope if you have gotten to this point, yes, God's land down under Harpazo. That's what we're doing. I have been seeing hundreds and hundreds of of numbers. The 153, the 458, the, the 410 for God Almighty out of Strong's. It's, it's all of these things, and it's just overwhelming at one point. But it's because it's about to happen. I love you, brothers and sisters. And if you don't know Jesus, this is, this is your chance. It's your chance. He loves you. He loves you so very much. You would have no idea. You really, you really don't know, and you, you want to know. He loves you more than you could possibly imagine. And he has already paid for your sin debt, for your wrongs, for your, the things that separate you from God. He's already paid for that on the cross. He was buried and he rose from the dead after three days. And, if, and he offers to you a free gift of salvation, of eternal life. And all you have to do is say yes to him. And I pray that you will do this now. Reach out to him and say, Jesus, yes, I accept that free gift. I want to be with you. What an amazing thing that we see in your word. I want to know that love. I want to know it now. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you did this for me. I receive it now in Jesus' name. And if you prayed that, I want to be the first one to welcome you to the family of God. 
and I look so forward to meeting you in the clouds. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and I will see you in the clouds. Listen for the trumpet. It's about to sound. Maranatha. God bless.